everyone. Here at Riverside, we love families and we love kids. And so we have content specifically prepared for children to partner with you in raising children who learn to love Jesus. So join us with your child for Riverside Kids Online before our worship service begins. Simply click on the notes tab below where you will find various links to age appropriate video content for your child. After you've engaged with Kids Online, simply click back to this homepage and join with the adults for a time of worship and for hearing from God's Word. Hello and welcome to Riverside Online. I'm so encouraged that you've taken this time to engage with us in the worship of our incredible God and Savior and that we get to hear the preaching of God's Word. I want to start by reading from 1 Peter and from verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. My encouragement for us as we start to worship is this, that even though we are struggling in so many different ways with so many different things, God is still doing an incredible work in us and is still worthy of so much praise. Jesus, I'm thankful that we can take this time right now to worship you and that we are struggling, but you are worthy. And that even in the trials that we are facing, you are doing something in us and growing us and developing us to be more like you. And we thank you for that, Jesus. Amen. Stronger 
whistle And there's no place you would not reach To set me free, to set me free And there's no place you would not go To save my soul, you save my soul And there's no place you would not reach To set me free, you set me free To a brighter day, you fill me up with an everlasting joy. Here in my weakness, you are stronger. Here in my heaviness, you're my song of praise. You fill me up with an everlasting joy.
God, we are just so grateful for who you are and all of that you have done for us. And just to declare that you are worthy and to give you the praise and the glory and the honor that you are due. It's a joy for us to sing that and it's a joy for us to declare that. In your holy name, amen. What an incredible time of worship we have been able to have. And just to share with you that it has been so encouraging to see your generosity as a church during this time and your giving online because it enables us to do so much for those in Riverside who have need and for us to engage in our community and still do ministry as a church. All those details to do that and to give online are on our website and I encourage you to do so. The only announcement that we have is that on the 29th of June at 7 o'clock is the Journey Online Auction and Fundraiser. Journey is a ministry that we have here at Riverside and it's really an incredible discipleship ministry that many people benefit from. And I encourage you to find all those details on our website if you still want to be a part of that and be a part of their fundraising efforts that they have at the moment. I'm going to pray for what the Lord is doing in and through us as a church at the moment. And, um, and then we're going to hear from Steve as he brings the next part of the series that we're in. God, I'm just so thankful that you have been generous to us as a church and all the resources that we have to bless your people and to bless the community around us. God, that we are so blessed that we can still do ministry in this space. And God, just as we hear from Steve now, won't you just soften our hearts and open them so that we can hear from you and grow uh, and be challenged through your word so that we can be uh, your church here in the south of Joburg and be transformed more into the image of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey everyone, so the coldest that I've ever been is when some friends and I hiked to the top of the amphitheater in the Northern Berg and uh, we were students, we were so underprepared, it's absolutely beautiful up there, sometime you need to do that, but let me just give you an idea of how cold it was. So we set up our tents mid-afternoon and at about 4 o'clock it is so cold we decided to retreat into our tent and stay there and have an early supper. So our supper for that night was two minute noodles right so uh, we cooked up the two minute noodles in the tent strained out the noodles to eat and we put the soup outside we ate the noodles and about I don't know 45 minutes hour later we decided to go and have the soupy part of the noodles it had been outside for about an hour the sun hadn't even gone down yet and there was a layer of ice that had formed on these noodles that were boiling about an hour before that so that's how cold it was anyway that night was literally the coldest I have ever been but the next morning we woke up super early because we couldn't sleep any longer but we woke up to this most incredible view as we we're at the top of the amphitheater so looking down the clouds were below us it was absolutely stunning now we had only planned to stay up there for one night so we had to pack down our tents and get back to our cars but for those of you who have been up there um, the amphitheater kind of goes up and forms almost like a tabletop moment and while there are some higher peaks in neighboring Lesotho there's a little peak at the back of this area known as the Mont or sources which is one of the highest points in South Africa so we thought just before we go up and pack up our tents and go back down, we're just going to walk over there to the Montel Source Peak. And so we started walking. In our minds, we thought it would take about 10 minutes to walk there, 10 minutes to walk back. And I can't remember how long it was before we realized it doesn't feel like we're any closer to the Montel Sources than we thought we were. And we carried on walking and then you climb over some rocks and a little hill and then it's not any closer than when we were half an hour ago. And then we realized what was going on. What was going on was because of the lack of houses or cars or people or trees, we had no perspective for how close this peak actually was. And so every time we thought we should have been getting closer, we still probably had whole kilometers to go. And the reason why I bring this up is because right now as a nation, especially Johannesburg, we are going through just an incredibly violent third wave of the coronavirus. 
And here we are over a year into this whole thing. And maybe you're thinking that we should have peaked by now. We should have been there by now. We should have in fact turned around by now. Life should be normal by now. Now going back to our story, eventually we did peak and it was quite amazing standing on top of this uh, the Monto sources just knowing that we're on one of the highest if not the highest points in South Africa and and then we could continue with our day and and again we have been, as a church been going through the series called worship in the midst of where we've been looking at the life of David his highs and a lot of his lows and how he processed these seasons of his life with the Lord and we know how he processed these seasons with the Lord because we have the Psalms and many of these Psalms are connected to two moments in this narrative of David. And so we've been looking at many of his lows as David spent a lot of his time on the run from King Saul. And we're hoping that these Psalms and these sermons have given you some handles as you've been experiencing challenge after challenge so that, listen, you can go through this with God or you can go through these challenges without God. And we want to help you process these challenges and these moments with the God who loves you so much and who wants to engage you even in these difficult seasons. Now, for us as a family, some of you know that uh, all four of us were diagnosed as COVID positive about two weeks ago. And for the most part, uh, we weren't showing symptoms that were too bad until Bianca actually took a turn for the worse. And turns out that she developed COVID pneumonia and has be, had to be hospitalized for five days. And it was a very uh, harrowing moment for us as a family. And we were afraid. And I remember one of the nights that she was in the hospital, um, I, I didn't know what was going on. And if I tell you the truth I was afraid I was truly afraid and I had just preached on Psalm chapter 40 and I just told you as a church that we need to process our difficult moments with God and so I had to listen to my own sermon and I had to sit down with my Bible open at Psalm chapter 40 where the opening line says I waited patiently for the Lord and I challenge you that um, in our difficult moments, when our heads dip below the waves, that we need to wait patiently and expectantly for the Lord. And so I had to sit there with God and say, God, I'm waiting for you. And then a few verses later, it says, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. And I was like, Lord, right now, yes, I am trusting that you're going to send the right people her way and the right medication her way. But I'm declaring right now that I'm trusting you and you alone. Now, thankfully, uh, Bianca is home now and we're all recovering and we're so grateful for your love and your support during the season. But I know that just like David, it took years of challenge after challenge after challenge. And just like us, we thought we should have been at the peak by a certain point in time, but it just seemed like we were never getting there. Some of you are there. You feel like you're not getting there. There's just one more hill and another one after that and another one after that one. And, and the, I want to encourage you to take these Psalms to heart, to take these sermons to heart. But just like there did come a moment when we did eventually peak, so there are also going to be moments of victory in our life where there is turnaround, where we do see God's hand, where we do see God's power. And here's the thing. Just as important as it is for us to process our challenges with God, we need to process our victories with God. You see, the time came in David's life where his battle with Saul was over, when he became king and he was able to peak and he was able to revel in that victory. And he did it with God in the same way that he processed his difficulties with God. And so today we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 18. Now, Psalm 18 is a psalm of victory, a psalm of jubilation, and a psalm of David expressing just his joy and his confidence in God as he is in this moment of peaking. So turn with me to Psalm chapter 18. It is a long psalm, so we're not going to be able to look in detail at every point of it. But there are three thoughts that I want to give you to help you process your peaking moments with the Lord. So let's read Psalm chapter 18. Now, many of you know that um, before some of these Psalms, we get a bit of insight as to which part of David's life this is connected to. So I want to start reading from that point here. So this is before verse 1, Psalm chapter 18. 
for the director of music. This is something to be sung and celebrated by the people of Israel. Of David, the servant of the Lord, he sang to the Lord the words of this song. When the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So this is the moment of peaking, a moment of victory. And this is what he says in verse 1. He says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I love you, O Lord, my strength. And so the first thought I want to give you as you process not only your low points, but your high points with God, is to give God your love. Give God your love. I love the fact that the first thing that comes up in David's heart as he's experiencing this high point in his life is that he loves God. Now, what would you do if you heard of someone, let's say he's a young guy and uh, he comes from a home with a single parent. Let's say it was a single mom and this single mom worked two, three jobs in order to, to sustain her kids. She sacrificed greatly for her kids. She often went without so that her kids could have what they needed in order to develop and in order to grow and in order to receive education. Imagine he went through high school and then he went through varsity and then he disappeared only to ever come home when he wanted money from his mother. Now imagine you knew that person and you knew the story and you knew the details of the story. You would say to yourself, there's something this kid doesn't get. This kid clearly doesn't know how much his mother has sacrificed for him, how much she has loved him. And there's something that is, there's a, lot of, there's a switch that's not going on. He is not responding in love. He's not responding in a way that is somehow proportional to what she has done in his life. And guys, we can be the same way. We sometimes, for whatever reason, reason feel so shortchanged by God. And, and we wonder if we're blessed. And yet Ephesians 1 says we are blessed in Christ Jesus. We have received all spiritual blessings in Christ. We sometimes feel alone and yet God says, but I am your father. I am your good father and I give good things to you. And then bad things happen in our life and God says, but I am turning these bad things that were intended for evil for your good. And I am with you in those moments and I'm giving you myself and I'm giving you salvation and I'm defeating your enemies by sending my son to die on a cross for you. And I'm giving you his life, his righteousness righteousness and yet sometimes our response just belies the fact that we just don't get it and David is teaching us that our appropriate response to all God's goodness in our life is to love him was David David grateful yes he was was David thankful of course he was but even more than that his response was a response of love isn't this the greatest commandment the greatest commandment is that you love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, and all other acts of obedience and love come out of this single greatest commandment. And this is what David is doing. He is loving God in response to all that God has done in his life. And so I want to challenge you as you become aware of all that God is to you and all that he has done for you. Yes, be grateful. Yes, be thankful. But even more than that, Give Him your heart and your life in a loving response to who God is so that you too can say, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The next few verses, uh, David describes God as a rock and a fortress, and he describes some of the difficult moments that he's been through. And we've looked at some of those themes in the last few Psalms. But now I want to look at verse 7, and I'm going to read to verse 19. And as we read these verses, I'm going to ask you to maybe close your eyes. There's some very beautiful poetry that's going to come out here. And let the words of uh, these verses wash over you. This is what it says from verse 7. The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because he was angry. Remember, David is describing God saving him and, and God bringing him to this moment of peaking and victory in his life. Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth, burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down, dark clouds were under his feet. 
He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. The dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advanced with hailstones and bolts of lightning. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot arrows and scattered the enemies. Great bolts of lightning and rooted them. The valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of breath from your nostrils. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from our powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place and he rescued me because he delighted in me. And so as David is thinking about this great God who has acted on his behalf, in these verses, I want to encourage you as the second thought for today is to give God the glory. Our first point is to give God your love, but now to give God the glory. Now, remember, the Psalms is often written in a genre which is more poetic than anything else. And so what is happening here is not necessarily David having this picture of God riding chariots and, uh, you know, smoke coming out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth. This is David poetically describing how he, in his mind's eye, sees God acting on his behalf. In his mind's eye, it is big. It, it is cosmic as God brought him to this point in his life. And so I want to ask you just in a moment of honesty, if for David, it was these pictures of a thunderstorm and this great act of God working cosmically, how do you often see God? What sort of metaphor would you use? I love this idea of a thunderstorm. In Joburg, we're quite familiar with them here in the half felts. And most of the time we experience thunderstorms from the safety of our own home. But I don't know if you've ever been on a farm or in the country or maybe even exposed out in nature when one of these thunderstorms have come. And maybe you've experienced its power and realized how small you were. And for David, this is him in worship as he sees and recognizes all that God has done. But how would you describe God working in your life? How how do you see God in your mind's eye? Would you use this image of a powerful thunderstorm and whether God is working in a sustaining way in your life, just keeping you going and providing all that you need as you walk through a difficult season or whether like David, you're experiencing a, a peak moment, a high moment, a moment of victory in your life. How would you describe God's work? And often as I think about that, I wonder what we're not seeing. I mean, if we could actually see all that God is truly doing, all that he is doing in every single detail of our lives and whether it's turning evil for our good or giving us good things or the way he is protecting us or the way he is changing the course of events in our lives. If we could truly see that, maybe we too would use language like David to glorify him as we in our hearts and minds see what God is doing. But we don't see those things and we don't believe those things. And so we don't glorify him in the same way that David does. See, the Bible says that we are to live by faith and not by sight. Now, that's not some sort of name it, claim it theology or in the name of faith, you make some bad decisions that Jesus somehow has to back up on your behalf. No, faith is living as if what God says is true is actually true. But if we live by sight, that means we're defining our idea of what we think God is and isn't doing in our lives by what we see and perceive with our five senses. And because we're living by sight and because we don't think we're seeing God's activity in our lives, we're not recognizing all that He is doing. But if we live by faith, That means that even if I don't see it, or even if I don't feel it, I know he's at work. I know he's turning bad for my good. I know he's building faith in my life. I know he's purifying me. I know he's saving me. I know he's good to me. I know he is present. I know he is there. And then I can give him the glory for all the things in my life. I mean, we sing that out in one of the songs that we sing, Waymaker. 
when we say, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. My question is, do you believe those words? See, one day the time will come when God will pull back the curtain and we will see how he has been involved in billions of ways that we failed to see and we will glorify him. But we also have an opportunity this side of that time to live by faith and to trust that God is at work in this cosmic way on your behalf. And for that reason, we can glorify him. Then we're going to jump ahead to verse 13 and we're going to read from verse 30 to 42. And as we read these verses, we're going to learn how this is the third thought for today. We can give God the credit. We can give God the credit. Let's quickly read from verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You give me your shield of victory and your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. You broaden the path beneath me so that my ankles do not turn over. I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them so that they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. You armed me me with strength for battle. You made my adversaries bow at my feet. You made my enemies turn their backs in flight and I destroyed my foes. They cried out for help, but there was no one to save them. To the Lord, but he did not answer. But I beat them as fine dust. Born on the wind, I poured them out like mud in the streets. I hope you heard what I was trying to emphasize there, because just like sometimes we fail to see what God is doing, so we fail to give him the glory. We sometimes define ourselves by what we see at the level of what I do and what I see other people doing. And for that reason, I fail to give God the credits. What David is doing, he is recognizing he is peaking and he's looking back at all that has happened. And yes, he recognizes how it has worked out practically. He's thinking through what this looked like. And yet for him, he recognizes that it is God who is doing all of this in him and through him. And so sometimes, guys, if we're struggling to see God, I think it's because we're giving all the credit for all that's happening in our lives to ourselves or to the people around us. Now, here's something so important that we need to understand, and it is that God uses people. God uses people. Guys, I, I'm, I'm hoping you're hearing me. God uses people to do his work. This is not some kind of plan B. This is plan A. If you think about all the stories in the Old and the New Testament, it was always God using people to do his work. Yes, there are those moments where we interact with God directly. We experience his love and his grace and sometimes his supernatural work directly. But most of what he does in this world, whether I look at my life or the pages of scripture, he's going to do through people, through people. And so my point is this. If I only recognize the single digit percentage of what God is doing by those more supernatural moments, by those more special and sometimes even rare moments, and everything else in my life, I give credit to people. That means I am missing out on 95% of what God is doing in my life. And I fail to give him the credit for that. Let me give you an example. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, Paul says, Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comforts, and guys, we want to experience the Father of compassion. Now, I want you to know and experience the God of all comfort. But how does he do this? Well, he comforts us in all our troubles. Yes and amen. So that we can comfort those 
in any trouble with the comforts we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. And somehow, what this verse is describing is that when I am being comforted by people, I am actually experiencing the comforts of God, the Father of compassion and the God of all comforts. And so we are called to receive comfort and compassion from Him through others and in turn to give others comfort and compassion so that they in turn can receive comfort not only from you but from God. And this is one of the reasons that I ask you, in fact, I beg of you, do not distance yourself in this time from Christian community. I know it can be tricky. I know it can be hard. I know sometimes we experience disappointments with people. And I I know being online or doing life group online or doing community online is so hard. I know it feels so unnatural. I know we have to be safe. I know we have to restrict engaging with people directly, especially in this third wave. However, if we are cutting ourselves off from people, we are cutting ourselves off from so much work that God wants to do in your life or through your life into the lives of others. One of the biggest ways we are going to experience God is through others. So like David, we can see what others have done. We can thank them. We can honor God for them. But we can also recognize that it is God loving me, God comforting me, God helping me through others. But not only do we sometimes fail to give God the credit when we look at what other people have done in our lives, but sometimes we fail to give God credit when we look at what we have done with our own two hands. Now, contrary to popular belief, when I stand up to preach, whether it's like this to a camera or whether it's in front of you in person, is I I don't go into a trance and become overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit and find my mouth saying things that I never planned and my hands doing things. Yes, there are moments that I do feel God's power and presence upon me. There are many moments when I don't necessarily feel it, but just because I'm not aware of it doesn't mean He is not at work in my life. This is what David knew. When he looked at what he did, he didn't restrict himself to the work of his hands. He knew it was God working in him. God providing all the physical and spiritual resources that David did. Paul also knew this, which is why he says to us in 1 Corinthians 4 verses 7, he says, Well, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Now, I am so concerned that you look at the victories and the successes and the mountaintops in your life through the lens of what you have achieved through your hands, failing to recognize all that God has provided for you and how he is truly the one that even though he used you, that he is the one who deserves all the credits. Now, today we're going to be coming and landing at the communion table and I just want you to keep that in mind as we read these last few verses so from verse 46 the Lord lives praise be to my rock exalted be God my savior he is the God who avenges me who subdues nations under me who saves me from my enemies you exalted me above my foes from violence men you rescued me And though I will praise you among the nations, O Lord, I will sing praises to your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. You see, the thing about the the life of David is that the, the life of David was never exclusively about the life of David. But rather, David's life was always pointing forward to the greater king who was to come. To the greater and better David, who would actually bring not only the kingdom of Israel, but the kingdom of God to planet earth. And so David's life points forward to the life of Jesus. 
The greatest victory in the story is not that David became king, but that God came as king to save us and to save us from our enemies. The the victory is not just that God saved David from his enemies, but that he defeated our enemies as our king. And he didn't do this by sitting on opulent throne. He did this by climbing onto a cross. And in that way, we too can say the Lord lives. Praise be to God, my rock. He is a God who avenges me and subdues, subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. And so as we come to the communion table, I'm going to ask that you look at God the same way David did. But we also look at who Jesus is through the lens of this psalm. The God who saves. The God who is king. The God who is sovereign. The God who is involved in every aspect of my life, but also the God who defeated my enemies and who saved me from sin, from Satan and from hell so that he could give me himself and so that I could experience the God who lives and the God who saves. So I hope that you've got your elements with you and we're going to take the bread as a picture of Jesus' body who has broken on our behalf so that he could save us as our king. Let's eat together. And then we're gonna take the grape juice or the wine, picture of Christ's blood that's a shed on our behalf, so once again, his life could become our life. Let us drink together. And let's end off by praying verse 50 together. He gives his king, he gave David, now he gives us great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. And Father, you've given your king victories and therefore you give us victory. You have shown unfailing kindness to us. And Father God, we know that we are David's descendants because of who you are, King Jesus. And so we love you. Just like David responds by giving you his love, we respond by giving you our love. And Father, we also give you to the, the glory as you recognize all you have done in our lives. And we also choose to give you the credit. Father, where we have often given the credit to ourselves and to other people in our lives, we give you the credit. You are our great King and our great God. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. See him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head. The Father's heart displayed for us, oh God, we thank you for the cross. Lifted up on Calvary's hill, we cursed your name, and even still, you bore our shame, and paid the cost, oh God, we thank you for the cross. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, You will reign forevermore. The victory is Yours. We sing Your praise, endless hallelujahs to Your holy. Is yours. And 
offer up this sacrifice for every sin. Our Savior died, the Lord of life can't be contained. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. 